Now let's discuss curler illumination or alignment of the microscope. And to do that, we're going to refer back to an earlier diagram that we used previously that shows you the field diaphragm in the microscope. Remember, the light leaves the illuminator and travels through the field diaphragm on its way up to the stage. We want to align our optical system so that we have no specular reflection or internal reflections in the microscope. And in order to do that, we have to close down the field diaphragm so that we see it in the field of view. And that looks something like this. Here you see your field of view, you see your specimen in focus, and you see the leaves of the field diaphragm uh, centered to the field of view and highly in focus. In order to perform this alignment, you have to close your field diaphragm down until you see it in the field of view. Then you raise and lower your condenser until these leaves become nice and sharp. Once the leaves are sharp, based on the height of the condenser, you use alignment knobs on the condenser to align that diaphragm to the field of view. Once it is perfectly aligned to the field of view, you open the diaphragm just outside the field of view, and now your optical path is aligned with your light path. Now let's go back to our discussion of reflected light illumination for fluorescence microscopy. Remember that we have a reflected light illuminator with a lamp house here that is sending light through our excitation filter down from the dichroic mirror to our specimen and back up to the observer. The lamp in this lamp house typically is called an HPO lamp, a high pressure mercury lamp. And you can see two examples of mercury burners here. This is a 50 watt mercury burner and a 200 watt mercury burner. And what happens is there is an arc that's formed across these two electrodes, a very bright arc. And so a lot of illumination is pumped out by these uh, bulbs. You never want to look at one of these bulbs with the naked eye. You will ruin your retina. So if you ever see an HBO burner putting light out through a lamp house that you can see visually, you want to either turn off the lamp or make sure that you don't look at it because you'll burn your retina. Now the HBO burner puts out what's called an emission spectra. An emission spectra is a tremendous amount of light across a whole series of wavelengths. And so if we just look at the emission spectra of the HBO bulb, you'll see a large amount of light. So our graph would show a large amount of light across all these wavelengths. And so all these wavelengths would be covered by the HBO burner with a tremendous amount of illumination. We're all familiar with the way that you can take white light and pass it through a prism and get the rainbow out of that light. That shows us that white light is comprised of all those colors of the rainbow. Each color is a specific wavelength. So UV would be something around 300 or 320, blue would be 420, green would be 520, and so forth. Each color has its own wavelength. Now this is important in fluorescence. Because in fluorescence, we are exciting a specimen with a short wavelength of light, and the specimen will glow in a longer wavelength of light. That's called fluorescence. Some bacteria, dinoflagellates, other organisms autofluoresce. You're familiar with bioluminescence in aquatic systems. When you run your fingers through the water, you see light glowing. That's autofluorescence, bioluminescence. So most tissue types will autofluoresce. They will give off a light on their own when you excite them with a short wavelength of light. So in fluorescence, it's important to understand what our excitation light is and what our emission light is. We're exciting with a low wavelength of light. In this case, we're using blue light. 
from about 440 nanometers up to about 500 nanometers. That's blue light. So that's our excitation light that we hit our specimen with. Then the specimen gives off light in a longer wavelength. And so here we see the emission light, which is green, from about 470 nanometers up to 560 nanometers or so. There is a law called Stokes' Law of Fluorescence, which says that when you hit tissue with a wavelength of a certain number, it will always autofluoresce or give off light at a longer wavelength. There's a Stokes shift. So you're always going to see a longer wavelength light than the one that you excited it with. In fluorescence microscopy, we use certain filters that produce our excitation wavelengths and allow us to see our emission wavelengths. And so the figure that we have on the screen now shows a typical filter cube. And in the filter cube, we have light coming in from the illuminator into the excitation filter. So this is a filter that's going to deliver the specific wavelengths of light to our specimen. Once that light hits our specimen, emission light will come off our specimen. And so that's going to travel from below and come through this dichroic mirror. So light coming in hits the dichroic mirror and is reflected down. Emission light comes from the specimen, passes through the dichroic mirror, and then passes through a barrier filter. The barrier filter is going to restrict the emission light to the actual wavelengths that we want to see. So the filter package is a very important part of the fluorescent microscope. Hi, this is Mark Armitage. I have about 30 years experience in microscopy. Just to give you a little background, I started out as a laboratory technologist at the University of Florida in the neurosurgery department of the teaching hospital there at Florida. And we taught uh, practicing neurosurgeons how to do micro neurosurgery. So we used operating microscopes and I was hired out of that lab by Carl Zeiss, the microscope manufacturer that's about 150 years old. So I traveled all over Florida and the Caribbean servicing and selling Carl Zeiss microscopes. After that, I was hired by Olympus, and I did the same with Olympus for many years. And then a microscope company moved me from Florida to the West Coast, and I've been in California since about 1984. I learned electron microscopy during the course of my master's program, and I was trained by Dr. Richard Lumsden, who was the dean of the graduate school at Tulane University and a world-renowned parasitologist. So I learned a little parasitology, enough to be dangerous, and I learned a lot of electron microscopy. And since then, I've had many publications, both in light microscopy and electron microscopy journals. I came here to Cal State Northridge to uh, rebuild the electron microscope laboratory, which had been shut down for some period of time. And we've successfully gotten uh, three electron microscopes running. And now we have this beautiful new, brand new confocal microscope that you're learning to operate. So I've had a lot of fun in microscopy. I've seen a lot of different things, been to a lot of different places and laboratories. And uh, I hope you enjoy the time that we spend on these videos. Thank you.